I think they said yesterday that 372 or 73, something like that. Oh, okay. So, uh, so about about 10 percent, yes. And there is still results from from all of the the debris that they breathed in. There are some who passed, but on that initial day, it was nearly 400 people. And uh, and so one of the things I'd like for us to do uh, to begin with today is I want us to pause, and we're not going to have a moment of silence. That really annoys me. <laughs> You know, back in America, we didn't have a moment of silence. We prayed, okay? This is America. We're going to pray. So would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, today, we turn our thoughts to you. And Lord, uh, we're moved as we remember 15 years ago today what happened. And how 3,000 people lost their lives on this day. And Lord, a lot of them were people who were doing what you said is the greatest demonstration of love that a human being can demonstrate. Lord, you said, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And Lord, it's actually pretty phenomenal that the number was not much higher. I remember that morning and hearing of the attacks and knowing that well over 100,000 people worked in those buildings, Lord, I thought there would be at least 20 or 30,000 that died. And it's nothing more than your mercy and grace that there were not more people who died that day. But today, Lord, uh, we ask you to comfort those who lost loved ones. Grant them your peace. May through this experience, Individually, may people recognize that there's something far more important than the material things that most people go and pursue every day. That life itself is far more precious. And Lord, you said in the Word, it's not in the abundance of things that a man's life consists, even when he has a lot of things. Lord, there's nothing more important than people. You are in the people business, and we want to be about your business, Lord. And so, Lord, uh, today, we ask you to comfort those. We also ask you, Lord, especially the families of the first responders who went and laid down their lives. And by their efforts, saved the lives of hundreds of people. And, Lord, they're still doing it. Many, that that is placed on their heart. They go out every day and risk their lives in order to attend to those who are in crisis. So we ask your blessings. Right here in our community here, our volunteer fire department and, and people that are uh, EMTs that provide medical aid. And many in this room have been recipients of their kindness and their assistance. So Lord, today we thank you for those that are willing to do that. May you bless them because only you can repay them. And those uh, family members even since then, as others whose lives were lost fighting fires and fighting forest fires and rendering first aid on the highways. God, this day, may they sense your nearness. And Lord, may they know of our gratitude. So today, Lord, we say thank you to the first responders. And we say thank you to our military personnel and our law enforcement people that risk their lives every day. We offer them up to you, ask you to be merciful to them, and may your angels be about them for protection. And Lord, may we not be ungrateful, as so many we hear in the media, especially superstar millionaires, that complain about their lot in life. And Lord, they have no gratitude in their heart for what so many have gone through. To preserve and to protect and to defend our nation that allows us to enjoy liberties that aren't perfect, but they're still the best in the world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm delighted today that uh, Ro, and you'll see her name, actually I had to double check, got it spelled and listed correctly in the bulletin. Uh, Rowena, who is known uh, by her friends as Ro, 
She comes with our group of ladies that commute from Florence uh, every Sunday, and we're delighted that she's been doing that for some time. And actually, I don't know a whole lot about Rome, except I see the joy of the Lord on her face. We fellowship on Tuesday nights at the windmill at Bible study, and then they've chosen to travel the road and come be with us uh, Sunday after Sunday. And she's going to come and share a word of testimony uh, for us this morning. And as she's coming, I'm just reminding you the scripture says that God's people overcame the enemy by the blood of the Lamb, that's what Jesus did, and by the word of our testimony. And Rose is going to come and share a testimony today. Sweetheart, would you come? God bless you. I'm going to try to adjust this. Much better one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> <laughs> Marcus, can you see? Is that good? Can you okay. hear me? All right. <laughs> well, I'm glad Pastor did something in regards to 9-11, but it's also Grandparents Day today, and I was thinking about all the little ones and, and the people who never got a chance to be mothers or grandmas or grandpas and all the great-grandparents that were lost, and um, I just think we, we could remember them too, <laughs> but so many people, and such a horrible thing, but Pastor's right, he doesn't know a whole lot about me, but today that we're going to fix that. <laughs> All right, <good> <laughs> I, I do like the idea that we're sharing the testimonies. I've never been in a church where you did that. Sometimes you would do it at prayer meeting or just one-on-one, but like for a lot of us, we're all from different backgrounds and different places, and we don't really know each other. And I think it's a, a good opportunity, even though it makes you a little nervous. But I will tell you straight out that I've done a lot of wrong things in my life. I've made a lot of bad decisions. I've fallen down from grace a few too many times, but every time the Lord has been there to forgive me and, and lift me up. Amen. And that forgiveness and God's love and patience is why we're all here today. I had a pretty horrific childhood. I can identify with some of the other people that have talked, and all I'm going to say about mine is there was a lot of violence, physical, mental, and sexual abuse. Years ago, when the Farrah Fawcett movie, The Burning Bed, came out, my mom and I watched it together, and we said, we could do better than that. <laughs> if they really went horrible, we got it. <laughs> but we lived through it. And I'd like to say that my father was the violent one, but he was not the sexual abuser. There were other family members in that room. But it was so bad in my house that the police were called all the time, and a lot of the parents wouldn't let their kids play with us. They didn't want anything to do with my family. And I have a brother who's three years younger than me, and he, I chose to just submit, uh, submerge the bad things. And it's only been in the last few years that I really remember, and it's because of my brother and my cousin, who lived with us, that I remembered more than I'd like to remember. But anyway, when I was 13, a really nice boy of 15 wanted to take me to the movie. And that's when you could go to double feature, one cartoon, and a big, long 20-minute newsreel for a quarter. <laughs> but that's how long ago it was. But his mother said, no, her father's crazy. The police are there all the time. You're not going with her. Well, he really wanted to go with me, but he, of course, obeyed his mother. But he did tell his mom that I was different, and I wasn't responsible for how my parents were. But we still didn't date, but we did manage a few school dances where we were together. But I would love to see him now and be able to tell him, you know, I'm glad you believed in me. I never forgot that. But, okay, so now you guys know that I have a lot to forgive. But in my life, I didn't really understand forgiveness. I, I hadn't seen it. And I really didn't understand it, but I knew I did not want to repeat 
in my life what I lived through. And to do that, I needed to find someone I could use as a role model. But there was nobody in the whole circle of my family that I really thought could fill that role. They, they all had issues. And <laughs> there was no one I looked up to. So I turned to the Bible. My mom did drag us to Sunday school when she could. Um, we didn't have a car, we walked. And so we went to the Free Methodist Church. And those people are holy and righteous, and I never fit in. <laughs> <laughs> but but my mom went because that was the closest church and it was still like a three mile walk. But I I'm a reader. I was and always have been a, an avid reader. So I turned to the Bible and I studied Proverbs 31 daily. And I believe that's a very good guide for what kind of what kind of woman I wanted to be. Wow. I studied the ladies in the Bible, Ruth, Esther, the two Marys. They became like my aunts and sisters. Mm -hmm. And at 17, we were living in Long Beach, California, and I asked the Lord into my heart. There was a real heavy Navy chaplain, best chaplain in the world, and we lived on base. And he led me to the Lord. And I believe the Lord has always been with me but I haven't always been with him. Um, he's never forsaken me, and he's protected me in so many ways and, and guided me even before I came to know him. I could see his hand in my life. I firmly believe that we're responsible for the adults we become. I don't buy into people saying, oh, but I have a horrible childhood, I have this, I have that. That's nonsense. We need to be responsible for who we become. And I believe, when you know the Lord, that we have the life and the circumstances that he can best use and use for us and to his glory. I don't believe we can do any of it on our own. I know that I needed Christ, and I, I think we all do. I needed his strength. And I have turned to him, and he has carried me through an awful lot in my life. And I know there's still a lot more to come. I will never outgrow my need for him. And I can never repay him for all that he's done for me. The thing that I think has helped me most and that I'm most grateful for in my life is peace in all circumstances. And I understand that peace that passes all earthly understanding. And I would like to share just a couple instances where that peace and confidence got me through. This is you're going to learn. <laughs> I've been married three times. I was a child bride. That's probably no surprise to anyone because we didn't really have a lot of options and I had no one to guide me. But there was always someone who liked me. <laughs> anyway, I, I did get married very young and that ended tragically with the draft and, and Vietnam. Then I turned around and I married his best friend. We didn't even like each other when I was with his best friend, but we formed a bond in our grief, and, and we got married. And I like to say we tortured each other for six years before we got smart and moved on. It was a hard thing. Neither one of us wanted to give up, but we knew we were doomed from the start, really. But then I met my husband, Terry. At that time, he was 31 and I was 25. There was a lot of water under my bridge and a good sized pool under his. <laughs> but Terry knew immediately that he wanted to marry me. And I was absolutely sure there was no way I was going to get married again. I saw my family, I saw me, and I said, no, it only brings grief. I need to be on my own. Well, Terry was a former Marine and a very in charge person. And he gave me an ultimatum. We met on Easter Sunday in 1976. And he asked me to marry him pretty shortly after that. But I held out until July when he gave me the ultimatum. He said, we either get married by the end of September or I'm moving on. He said, I want to be married. I want a home. I want someone that's my companion for life. And he says, if it's not going to be you, I'm going to find someone else. 
Well, now that we were married for 38 years, I understand that we had no idea what marriage meant. Or if you really, truly love someone, you couldn't give them that ultimatum. <laughs> if you understood. But anyway, I was very upset. I, I had a feeling that he was a good man, and I didn't want to lose him, but I didn't want to get married. So I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. And one early morning, I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit say to me, this is the man I have for you and the path I want you to take. I never, ever doubted that. That, that voice, those exact words have never left me. Um, there's a verse in the Bible that kind of goes along with that, Jeremiah 29, 11, where the Lord says, for I know the plans I have for you to give you a future and a hope. And I think that, that probably went around in my head a lot. But the first miracle in my marriage was that I listened and we got married on September 3rd. <laughs> he was 32 by that time and I was 26. Now when I was married before, I had been treated at Stanford at their f fertility clinic and I was never supposed to have any children. But I got pregnant the first month we were married. And that's the second miracle. <laughs> the first was I listened. And, but when Terry was 38, he had a major heart attack. He actually had four heart attacks in a week. But one destroyed a, all but a fourth of his heart's pumping ability. Now this was my big, strong, six foot six marine that and he, he was brought to his knees. He had accepted the Lord just about a year and a half before the heart attack. But we had our son, he was in kindergarten at the time, and it was 10 years before Terry could return to his job as a nuclear transport driver for the Defense Department. So we had just built a home, we had a big mortgage, and you know, we didn't lose the home because I went to work full time. I was working part time at that time. But during our time together, we had, he had a lot of major health issues. He has severe arteriosclerosis, which doesn't just affect the heart, it affects the mind and the brain because of the arteries going to your brain. He had diabetes, Parkinson's disease. He went on to have three more heart attacks. He had quadruple bypass. And he had lung cancer caused by asbestosis. But there were days that we were more or less housebound, especially the last five years. We had moved to Arizona, and I had a mother who had Alzheimer's, and we were pretty much stuck in the house or for doctor's appointments. We were, in those first years, able to go to dinner, but he got, grew weaker and weaker until he could barely walk from the dining room table to the patio door to go out and sit outside. But there were days that I was sure I was going to run away or die myself, just lay out and die because I couldn't do any more. But those words that the Lord told me came back to me time and time again, and I didn't run away, and I didn't cave. I never doubted where I was supposed to be. I learned so very well that God gives us the strength that we need as we need it, not before. We can't put it in the bank and dry out. But, but we have to believe and trust that it's going to be there if we're doing the, the thing that would glorify God. The trust, the strength comes. Um, one instance, we had a, one of the heart attacks, but our son was in a nearly fatal go-kart accident when he was 16. We always went camping on Memorial Day to the same place in Squim, Washington. And we always took this one boy named Ryan with us to, you know, be with our son. Well, the kids were almost 16. They both had their driver's permits. And we had never let them go to the go-kart track without us. But I, I get migraines and I have a terrible headache. And I told my husband, I just need to go in and lay down. <laughs> And he said, you know, I don't feel so good today either. I think I'll lay down with you. And that never happened. If he might sleep in his chair, but he didn't like to lay down in the middle of the day. We went into the trailer, and we were sound asleep. And about 20 minutes later, the park ranger comes banging on the door. And 
Mr. and Mrs. Harding, we have to have you. There's been a terrible accident, and your son is not expected to live until you get to the site. It's a half a mile, you know, and I'm saying, how can he get hurt so bad on a go-kart? Well, what happened is the kids were racing, which is normal, it's a racetrack, and the brakes failed on his go-kart, and he went through the lean to building that housed the go-karts. There was nothing there to stop them. And the building collapsed on him, but two big spikes pinned him. And the go-kart, of course, kept wanting to go because the accelerator was stuck open. And it broke his neck and his bones, every bone in his face was shattered. So um, we were out of town, about 60 miles from home. We didn't know a soul. But my mom and dad were camping with us, and we had friends that were camping at another campground about 50 miles away. So I rode in the ambulance to the hospital, and my husband and my mom and dad came in the truck. We get to the doors, and it's just like in the movie, everyone is descending on us to help our son. And my husband gets to the door of the hospital, and he falls down. He had another heart attack. And he's, he could talk to me, but he says, honey, I can't help you. And we're, they were going to take him to the other side of the hospital. And he says, how are you going to get through this? Because I don't like blood, I don't like stitches, and my son's face was down on his chest. And I said, that man over there is going to get me a cold glass of water and a wet washcloth, and the Lord is going to hold me up. And I physically felt the Lord picking me up underneath my arms and getting me into the room with my son. And running in my running back and forth, I, I would try to see my husband and see how he was doing, but that didn't last long. I just told him, you're on your own. I can't be here, and, and it's more important that I'm with our son. And I needed... By that time, my folks were there, and our good friends that were camping came as well, and they are very good, good, good Christian people. And I told Gene, the man, I said, if you would go and be with Terry, then I don't have to worry about him anymore. And he did. Well, by, this happened about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and about 2 in the morning, I was just about to crash. I was almost hysterical. And I said, I've got to get away from all you people. They're chattering and trying to keep you happy and, you know, not worry. And I said, you're driving me bananas. So I said, I have to find a quiet place. Well, the hospital was under reconstruction, so they were adding a new wing. And I walked out into all the construction and the big plastic sheets hanging, and I sat down and I prayed. And the Lord said to me, I will give you the strength you need now, but your husband is going to be the strength you need for months to come. And he, he was absolutely right. And that gave me the strength to go on because I knew I didn't have to carry everything on my shoulders myself. And all the horrible things they thought would happen to our son, number one, he didn't die. They were sure he was going to be paralyzed from the neck down. He was not paralyzed. He was severely mangled because your body, I guess, is designed for your jaw and those bones to break if you have an injury like that. So that was a good thing. And they were able, we had a good good surgeon, big long story there, but we were not going to say that now. But a lot of miracles happened in that hospital. And they both came home on the same day and we were able to go on. And, and the Lord was right. My husband was the strong one in the months to come. So I am I'm grateful for that more than I can say. Um, Terry finally lost his battle, his war, because we would say we're winning the battle but we're losing the war. <laughs> and he passed away in 2014. And he was not a perfect man, and I'm definitely not perfect, but we were perfect for each other. I believe we helped each other become the man and woman that the Lord wanted us to be. And I, I had that peace that we did what we could. I was a bookkeeper and he was a truck driver. What did we know about dealing with 
30 years of long-term illness, you know, I mean, we, we did okay. I'm positive that we influence people in, in ways that we'll never know about on this earth. And now I'm moving forward through widowhood and the future with confidence that God isn't finished with me yet. And I found so many new friends, all of you people at this lovely church, the, the Bible study, and I'm so thankful. And you know what? I'm kind of proud of myself. I'm proud of the wife, the mother, the daughter, the friend that I've become. It took a lot of work on the Lord's part to help me forgive and leave the past behind. He has put wonderful people in my path that have encouraged me and prayed for me. I was in the nursing home business for 31 years. I met many couples with long-term marriages, whether the wife would be in the nursing home or the husband, and they gave me strength because I saw by their example, and I said, if they can do it, by God, I can do it. And I did. I look forward to many more years that I can tell people in so many ways the Lord has blessed and strengthened me. And he's heard my cry and when I have no idea how to pray. And he held me up when I couldn't stand on my own. One verse that's been dear to my heart even when I was young is Isaiah 46, 4. And the Lord tells us, I will be your God through all your lifetime. Yes, even when your hair is white with age, I made you and I will care for you. And I saw that from a young age and I see it now and I don't see it changing when I get another 20 years under my belt. <laughs> so and what he's done for me, he can do for all of us. We just have to ask and, and believe and it, it works. And I say, I think pastors kind of said this too, for those who don't believe, they have a great risk for us who believe that we're wrong, it hasn't hurt us one bit. We've learned how to live and get through our day and help and, help and encourage each other. But for those who don't and won't believe, they've got a whole different scenario. And I feel sorry for them. well enough that he also became a Marine. Wow. I know how strenuous that is, so the Lord didn't raise him. We had to get special uh, certificates or letters from the doctor stating that he couldn't handle the physical accident. Right. But one thing that he did, I knew my husband was a very handsome man, I think, and I could tell my son was going to be handsome. So on his mirror, I had a bright, bold, pink paper with black letters. It's not what you look like, it's who you are. And when he was going into surgery, the doctor said to me, now mother will never make him look normal. And he said, but we'll save his life. And I said, that's all we asked. I said, and I told him, you won't be operating alone. The Lord is here with you, with the cold time. And my son, he couldn't talk, of course, but he wrote me a note and he said, it's okay, mom. It's not what I look like, it's who I am. Amen. Rejoice in you, Lord, and how you sustained her through things that destroyed many others that didn't learn to lean on you. We thank you for her and for her willingness to share these personal things with us today. Prosper and bless her in these days that have been great. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You know, uh, one of the things that I think is important about sharing these things, uh, you know, the Bible could have simply said to us, Job was a man of great endurance and patience and faithful to God. You could put that in one verse. And we go, okay, what does that mean? But God gave us the whole book of Job so that we could see the endurance, the long-suffering, the patience, and the faithfulness of Job because of what we've heard. And I think that's one of the benefits of us sharing the testimony, and I think it is well worthy of the investment of time on Sundays to let people come and share these testimonies. So when we look at Roe, we go, oh my goodness, God did a great thing in her life. Rescued her from a life she could have given up on at a very young age, but God's hand was there through all of that. 
And we rejoice and give praise and blessings to God. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. And now it's time for us to rejoice in the Lord. If you would take your hymn book and open up to 572. Appreciate that Linda McDermott is willing to play today. Uh, being Grandparents Day, Linda Salerno had an exceptional thing happen. Her grandkids invited her for Grandmother's Day, for Grandparents Day, so she slipped away today. So thank you very much, Linda, for doing that for us. Let's stand together as we sing. I love to tell the story, and isn't that what we've been hearing this morning already? Praise the Lord for that.
I have to tell you, when the Lord sent us this instrument, I was going back and remembering all these beautiful classic pieces that Linda McDermott plays, and I kept thinking, oh, if she had played that on this, <laughs> it would really stir our soul. So it's okay with us if you want to go back and play some of those that you already played earlier this year, because we want to hear them on an instrument that is worthy of our Lord Jesus Christ to give Him glory and praise. Delighted that uh, the Lord has brought uh, Larry and Cheryl back to us. They're going to come and share some music. But uh, while they're thinking about what all, how they're going to do this, did anybody notice a couple of folks snuck in over here? Aren't you glad to have Kay and Terry back? Twenty-three. Twenty-three. Oh, only a slight exaggeration. <laughs> I'm delighted for that, and so glad to see Scott and Jeannie over there. God bless you guys. Glad to see you here today. And, uh, and so now, uh, Larry and Cheryl are going to share, uh, and then I'll have my say, since I haven't had a chance yet. Right? <laughs> Larry and Cheryl will not be sharing. Okay. Larry. There's a there's an invader in Cheryl's life. His name is Arthur. <laughs> and he's working on her real hard right now. And uh, I'm sorry to say that she can't be my as I call it, my heartbeat with the, with the bass guitar. But said with Linda playing classics, well I'm going to do a song by a classic if you would. This song is by Johnny Cash. Guess what? I like Johnny Cash. <laughs> <laughs> but when Pastor Rick asked if we would do a song today, I picked one out and Cheryl said, I don't think we should do the particular song that I was going to do. She said, why don't we do this song by Johnny Cash? Because if you think back to what today is 15 years ago, 9-11, and I know you all can think back to where you were at that specific moment. In my case, I was still working. I was on my way to work when I heard the news. I got to the, to the office and turned the TV on and saw that picture of devastation. And the one thing that I saw when firemen got up on the building and unfurled the red, white, and blue that had come down ever so big and we will remember. Cheryl said, why don't you do the song about the flag, which is the symbol, of course, of America. Johnny Cash wrote this, it's called that ragged old flag. Well, I walked through a county courthouse square on a park bench, an old man was sitting there. I said, your old courthouse is kind of run down. He said, no, it'll do for our little town. I said, but your old flagpole has leaned a little bit, and that's a ragged old flag you've got hanging on it. He said, have a seat. So I sat down. Is this the first time you've been to our little town? I said, yeah, I think it is. He said, well, I don't like to brag, but we're kind of proud of that ragged old flag. You see, she got a little hole in that flag there when Washington took it across the Delaware. And it got powder burned the night Francis Scott Key sat watching it and writing, oh, say, can you see? It got a rip in New Orleans with Packenham and Jackson tugging at her seams. And it almost fell at the Alamo with the Texas flag, but it waved on. She got cut with a sword at Chancellorsville and she got cut again at Shiloh Hill. Well, there was Robert E. Lee and Beauregard and Bray, and the south wind blew hard on that ragged old flag.
And on Flanders Field in World War I, she got a big hole from a Bertha gun. And she turned blood red in World War II, and she hung limp and low a time or two. She was in Korea and Vietnam, Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan. She went where she was sent by her Uncle Sam, and she waved from our ships upon the briny foam. But now they've about quit waving her back here at home. In her old good land, here she's been abused, she's been burned, dishonored, denied, and refused. And the government for which she stands has been scandalized throughout our land. And she's getting threadbare, and she's wearing thin, but she's in good shape the shape she's in. Because she's been through a whole lot more before, and I believe she can take it a whole lot more. So we raise her up every morning and we bring her down slow every night. We don't let her touch the ground and we fold her up right. So you see, I do like to brag, because I'm mighty proud of our ragged old flag. Thank you, brother. Thank you for that. So we're going to sing one praise chorus today, and uh, there's some new ones that we've been learning. This one we're going to have to sing off of the video because uh, we actually don't have music to it, and. Uh, Linda just has it in her head and she can play it, and uh, I would have a hard time leading it otherwise. So uh, I just ask you as we uh, take these moments to worship the Lord before we open up the scripture that uh, you, in your heart, just sing out to the Lord. We're going to sing dwelling places. Lovely are your dwelling places. Would you stand with me just one more time because you're going to have to sit for a little bit. <laughs>
minister to every part of your life.